That's right. We're here this afternoon. We are here with Dr. Gus Ramage right here on WCRS. He is one of the partners there at uh, Digestive Diseases. And, you know, when we think about digestive diseases, I think the thing we always think about are colonoscopies. But what you're going to find out this afternoon is there is so much more that goes on over there at Digestive Diseases. So I want to welcome Gus Ramage. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's great to be here. Well, Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, it's something that um, nobody really likes to talk about, but it's something that uh, is good to talk about and good to know about some of the other aspects because sometimes don't you find that people suffer for long periods of time when they could have gotten some help? Fortunately, people are beginning to realize a great deal more what is available to them, but, uh, but absolutely, yes. We, we see people, uh, I have seen people struggle with uh, swallowing problems that were easily fixable uh, and, and uh, other, other bowel problems that they either didn't think there was any help for or just uh, didn't want to talk about. That's probably one of the biggest issues, isn't it, Dr. Ramage, is uh, talking about it. Well, it is, because you really have to bring it up uh, with your physician and often, sometimes with your family uh, to, to, uh, to do these things. And we've sort of been conditioned uh, over, over at least the early parts of our lives not to discuss these matters. That's and so, uh, eventually, so you go to the it, potty it, by yourself, right? And that's right. <laughs> exactly. And, and you don't announce it to anyone. I have a, I have a three, I have a about to be three year old granddaughter. We're working on that with right now. <laughs> so, um, and she's so, probably quite proud of herself every time she goes. She's quite proud of herself. Makes the announcement, but, <laughs> uh, uh, but, and and we're we're trying to suppress that, and and we carry that right on through into adulthood. So, uh, so that is something we, that we do have to, to, to deal with a lot. But, uh, but I, I think one of the striking things when I, when I started here, and I, obviously I've been in Greenwood for a number of years, but uh, the, the people who came to me who had struggled with difficulty swallowing for years, and, uh, and we see them and, and uh, uh, do a dilation, and, and all of a sudden they're swallowing well, and and it's uh, it it's was it's very remarkable. We don't have that near as much anymore. People are learning. Well, it, I I think that um, every time I've heard somebody, and I think particularly with older people, you hear about I went in and had my esophagus stretched, oh, and, yes. you, and you go, your esophagus stretched, mm -hmm. and and yet that is something that is I guess more commonplace than we would normally think of. We do them every day. Every day. Every day. And what happens to the esophagus? Uh, the main thing is uh, is gastroesophageal reflux. The, that is that uh, the acid uh, from the stomach uh, uh, re regurgitates into the esophagus. Uh, most of the time, that simply results in heartburn, uh, with with very little damage to the esophagus. Uh, sometimes it can be a great deal more severe, uh, resulting in either low grade or even high grade ulcers in the end of the esophagus. Those ulcers heal, and as they heal, they can narrow the esophagus. I suppose it's kind of like a scab or something that thickens it? More, I, I liken it more to uh, a person, if you've seen a person who's had a burn mm -hmm. and has a contracture from that, from that scar of the burn, mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's uh, 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 ulcers heal with scar, and scar contracts. And in the case of the esophagus, when it contracts, it contracts uh, circularly. So you end up with a smaller and smaller space to be Correct. able to swallow the food. Correct. Yeah. And so we uh, uh, first you have to address the the reason, and that is to say, if there's ulceration there, we uh, we reduce the uh, acidity of the stomach, uh, begin to get the ulcer to heal, and then you're able to uh, to stretch up the esophagus, and and to, and then that maintains rather once once the ulcer is healed, uh, the esophagus maintains rather well, uh, and so it may be years until a, a treatment is needed again. Hmm. 
Well, it, well, you know, and so you can, you can, you, you just, how do you stretch it? Just because uh, I'm curious. We yeah. have, uh, we have uh, mainly two means. Um, uh, the, the, the one is a, uh, is a balloon that we can put through the uh, endoscope and inflate uh, to, uh, to, to stretch it. That's, uh, uh, we, can, we can watch that as it happens. It, uh, it's a, a little more conservative way to do it. Not quite as effective as the older just uh, uh, rubber tubes that, are, that we can lubricate and, and, uh, and use to, to stretch the area. They, those, uh, uh, the, the balloons, uh, the pressure from the balloon may not be adequate to stretch as much as you uh, would like. The, the others uh, tend to be a little more effective. Both are usually. Now, I know uh, people that have had this done that have just been amazed at the change mm -hmm. in, their, in their ability to swallow and to, I guess, take on more food, right? <laughs> which, Sorry. Which, which can actually uh, then, then, a bad wor thing. <laughs> then, then worsen the reflux issues, but, uh, among other things. But, but, uh, but no, it's good to be able to. Exactly. Very good to be able to. Yeah, exactly. Well, we've got so many different aspects that what we want to talk about. But first, I want to talk a little bit about you. You know, um, as far as a field, when you were growing up, what did you? What, would, what were you going to be? I. Didn't know for sure. I, at first, I thought I wanted to be a physicist, and then I thought I wanted to be an engineer. And you had to and, have been uh, a basketball player. I, I, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> as I always, tall as Gus Ramage is, he has to have been a basketball player. Were you a my, basketball my, player? <laughs> my excuse is that I wasn't tall enough. <laughs> you were tall enough. Well, uh, Gus, how tall are you? <laughs> I'm six feet eight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But it's not tall enough for me to be a good basketball player. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> but you, you thought maybe a physicist? Oh, you know, as a, as a uh, high school and early college student, you have all kinds of ideas. And, uh, and uh, then I, I actually trained as a chemical engineer at Clemson and, uh, and went to work as a chemical engineer for a couple of years before realizing that the, the corporate uh, situation wasn't what was best for me, and uh, and also sort of realizing that it was uh, that that uh, the interaction that I had had with people over the years. I my my father actually had a service station, and I grew up working there, and and I realized uh, a little belatedly that uh, that uh, that uh, daily interaction with people and uh, helping solve their problems and do things for them. Uh, was a real motivator for me and something I have enjoyed uh, ever since. So you went back to school? Went back to school. Wow. Yeah. And um, how did you decide on the field that you're in here? I, uh, of course, I went to medical school, finished that, went into internal medicine uh, because it was a complex and challenging field that I, that I liked. Um, Decided on gastroenterology a couple of years into, into internal medicine because, well, in part I, I, I got, uh, uh, I, I think I probably, in fact, definitely, I, I, I think everyone has something of that aversion that we talked about with our three-year-old mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that you, you, so I just don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I did a flexible, I, I did a, a, an old rigid sigmoidoscopy clip. And, uh, and in the process of doing that, I uh, found that, I, that doing those procedures wasn't near as distasteful as I thought it was. And after finding two or three cancers over the course of a month, I realized how incredibly useful and beneficial for people that could be. And, uh, and it really uh, intrigued me and sort of uh, made me decide to, to do gastroenterology. As I looked at it more, the other thing about gastroenterology that really appealed to me is that it's not one thing all the time. We, we do pancreatic disease, we do gallstone and bile duct disease, we do uh, liver disease, uh, we do gastric disease, ulcers, esophageal disease, 
and uh, and of course colonoscopy as we hope to get to uh, to discuss uh, colonic disease. So there's a there's a lot to master and a lot to uh, to keep you challenged. Absolutely. Well, we are here with Dr. Gus Ramage. He is with Digestive Diseases. We're going to hear a quick word from our sponsors, then we'll be back. Don't you go away. Hey, if you've got a question for Dr. Ramage, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be right back. Oh, that's right. We're here with Dr. Gus Ramage. Gosh, we were... We were just talking off the air about, uh, what shall we say, it's not the dark ages, but gosh, it was back in the late 70s, early 80s when you first got into this field. And just uh, when we talk about colonoscopies and what can be done today, we were discussing about um, how they determined if somebody had colon cancer and, and how what happened. Let's give them the short version. Well, uh, yeah. When I was in medical school in the 70s, uh, uh, this, was, uh, this diagnosis was done by x-ray. Uh, if someone saw a polyp on x-ray, and you really only saw the large ones mainly, um, then there was a, a set of, uh, of criteria of, of, uh, that were used to determine if someone needed to go to surgery to get that out. Uh, the idea, uh, even in the late 70s, was that, that there was no way to just go in there and very simply uh, remove those. Uh, that changed very quickly with the development of the, uh, and, and the spread of the, uh, of the fiber optic endoscope. And, uh, and I was very fortunate to be relatively early in that, not, not right on the not right at the first, but, but, near, but near the beginning. So really, it, your industry, as an industry, digestive diseases and all this, has really changed because of the equipment and whatnot that's out there today. It has changed dramatically over, say, 40 years. Over, over the past 30 years, the, the changes have been coming more slowly, mm -hmm. but still very significant because we now have video equipment that is much uh, easier to operate, much easier to accomplish the, what we what we want to do, and much easier for, for people to tolerate. Uh, we've gotten better with sedation. We've gotten much better with sedation. We've gotten better with uh, uh, with with many aspects of the procedures. Sure. And so, you know, when they talk about colon cancer today, they talk about it as one of the most preventable diseases. That's correct. Colon cancer is the, is the number two cancer killer of Americans, uh, and, and yet it is, the, uh, it, it is one of the most preventable cancers because it tends to grow very slowly. Uh, it, uh, it is, if it can be found either before it becomes actually malignant, uh, or early on in the course of the malignancy, uh, it can be it can be cured very very frequently. Uh, our many of our our goal now is to really prevent the cancer more than to find it more, more than to to wait for it to occur, uh, and that's accomplished not all the time but frequently. Now, what about diet when we talk about uh, digestive diseases? Has there been a change in diet? Is that making some of the differences? It's, the diet uh, is not making, I don't think, a great deal of difference. Uh, interestingly, many of the things that we attribute to diet uh, it's sort of sort of like many of the things we attribute to nerves. Um, that or stress. Once, what, or stress. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, we, we talk, uh, what, I, what has, has seemed to me over the years is, is we've begun to understand things more and begun to be able to treat them more effectively. What we've, we've, we've learned that maybe less and less is diet and stress and nerves 
and more and more is things that we can actually do something about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. And heredity plays a big part. I mean, that's the gene. Absolutely. And the, the genes are what is phenomenal, the way they're unwrapping or un developing and, and knowing about this now. Well, I, I certainly don't present myself as a genetic expert, and we have many of those. Uh, we're blessed with, with, with much, many of those folks here in Greenwood. Um, but uh, but genetics certainly plays a part in the development of, uh, of particular colon cancer. Uh, people who have family members, particularly uh, what we would call a first degree relative, that is to say a parent or a brother or sister or a child that, uh, who has a, a colon cancer or colon polyps, is at significantly increased risk over the average population. And yet, the average population by age 50 has significant risk even without a family member. So is it, is it just age or is it just part of what American, and it, you know, is this particular to Americans or are all people subject to it? Well. That is, that is the answer to that is complicated. Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll make it complicated. We'll work on it. Right. Um, the, um, uh, undoubtedly, there are factors related to the American diet and, uh, and the situation of Americans that increases our risk for colon cancer. We, we see that in groups who move from other countries to America, they actually uh, that their risk of colon cancer becomes, all, within one generation, the American risk and not the risk of the home country, wow. which, which, says that, which says that it's something about the way they're living and not something about the genes they brought with them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are clear genetic risk factors. Uh, the, the, sequence of genetic changes that occur as, uh, as a polyp develops into a cancer are well worked out, well understood. Why they occur, how to prevent their occurrence is not something that we are able to do at this point. Well, well um, I, I know that um, it's something that people don't like to talk about, but mm -hmm. it certainly is something that is a uh, good thing to do for your body. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we talk about, uh, and to sort of go into the, the matter of, uh, of colon cancer prevention, which I think is one of the things that we would like to, to have as a take home here. Um, there's basically two approaches. One is to, uh, is to find the cancer early. Uh, so that uh, so that it can be cured early, and the other approach is to try to to find the the lesions, the to find the abnormalities in the colon that will lead to cancer, and actually remove those so as to prevent many of the cancers from even forming in the first place. Uh, the the idea of of early of finding the cancer early is what we do with, with uh, stool testing for blood. Uh, the blood tests uh, in stool, which can be done in a couple of different ways, they've become a little more sophisticated. Uh, those are really directed at finding cancers primarily. Uh, uh, they have to be done yearly in order to be effective in doing that because you again, we want to find the cancer early, and those tests aren't very good at finding it, at finding the problem before it's an actual cancer. Okay, well we are here with Dr. Gus at Ramage. We're going to be talking about a lot of different aspects of what they do at digestive diseases. So uh, why don't you stay right with us? It's time for South Carolina News. We're going to be back, and if you've got a question, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be back after the news. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? 
or a college tuition hung on a wall, or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. All right, we're back here with Dr. Gus Ramage. He is one of the partners over there at Digestive Diseases. I tell you what, you know, when you start talking about all this stuff, Gus, it really gets, um, it's a subject we don't want to talk about most of the time. And yet it's a very fascinating topic when you really talk about the strides and the changes that have come about. Well, that's true. Uh, we were beginning to get into uh, the, the development of, uh, of colon screening uh, in terms of a colon, uh, a colonoscopy. Um, oh, there you go. You're talking about that word again, Gus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we we do a lot of that. <laughs> you do do a lot of that, and uh, let's talk a little bit about the changes in today's world. Well, uh, the there have been dramatic improvements in uh, both the, the the comfort that we're able to do it in, uh, and in the results that we're able to achieve. Uh, undoubtedly, the the thing that people I dislike the most about uh, about colonoscopy is the preparation, and we have uh, there are increasing numbers of of different approaches to the preparation, uh, and also of, of just different techniques of using the same old ones. We now uh, we now learned, for example, if you give half the prep the night before the test and half the prep the morning of the test, that not only do people uh, find it easier to do, uh, they're actually a lot cleaner. When they're a lot cleaner, we see a great deal better. Mm -hmm. One of the issues that we've had uh, with, uh, with, with the accuracy of colonoscopy has been uh, some difficulty in seeing uh, uh, abnormalities uh, on the right side of the colon, the furthest part. Uh, and that part was not as clean uh, uh, before we learned to to do to, to change our techniques. So that's uh, been a change over in only in the past uh, three or four years that has improved uh, uh, that has improved our outcomes a great deal. Also, our ability to sedate people is tends to get better and better, uh, so that uh, so that. Most folks who don't want to remember don't have to. That's not 100 percent, but it's, uh, but it's uh, the, the vast majority. So, um, and, and as far as the flexibleness of it and everything, it's a lot more comfortable. That's correct. The, uh, the endoscopes themselves are, are thinner. Uh, they, they actually, the, uh, they've been able to make them uh, more uh, more able to uh, to reach the cecum, more uh, that is to say, the end of the colon, more able to complete the examination than uh, than we uh, were formerly able to do. So, so should should somebody say, "Oh, that's not something I'm going to do"? Well, people do that. Yes, they do. Uh, that is uh, that is. Uh, we really hate for that to happen, and we we really work on ways to, to try to to improve it for folks so that uh, so that they won't uh, feel that way. Um, uh, in general, colonoscopy is just a great deal more comfortable than than many people think it will be. Most people who complete it. Uh, in fact, practically everyone who completes it figures out that the, the preparation, even though that's not all that pleasant, that was actually the worst part. And so, uh, so uh, it, it, seems, it, it seems to me, and I've had actually more than one myself. Um, I've had uh, more that, than your share. Uh, so I've, you I've, had, I've had my share. <laughs> Uh, to me, it seems a very small price to pay 
for uh, for a, a, a good deal of for a great deal of reassurance uh, about preventing a significant problem. Absolutely. So um, now you have the the center where you do just all we, of these. We do the endoscopic work uh, primarily at the Greenwood Endoscopy Center, uh, which is uh, which is a. Uh, an ambulatory surgical center, but really only for the performance of, of gastrointestinal endoscopy, just just these procedures, the uh, the upper endoscopy and the colonoscopy is what we do there. So, um, if you'd like more information, now you do have your website where information is available if you'd like to check it out, and there is oodles of information on the web to tell you more about this. There is. Uh, I always caution people in their access to the to the internet uh, because it is kind of scary what you can uh, hear. If it's yeah, on the internet, it's got to be it's, true, right, yeah, Doctor Ramage? Just, just <laughs> like in so many other uh, ways of publishing things that, uh, and, and the internet may be scarier than most, but um, but our site uh, at our site we try to uh, uh, to to screen to the reliable sources. Uh, uh, the, gastroenterolo the gastroenterology societies, the American College of Gastroenterology and the American Gastroenterological Association, have also very large websites uh, with access uh, to to information about almost all of the diseases we treat, and the, that is uh, very carefully screened. Uh, uh, accurate information that that, uh, uh, that is really worth your time. Uh, it, quite possibly, if you uh, if you simply Google the name of a disease, uh, you could you could get into some pretty scary stuff. <laughs> That's true. You know, I, I, it is amazing what you can read on the internet, and not only in diseases but in everything out there. I, 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 I say scary, but sc but but not only scary, but 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 dangerously inaccurate potential. Exactly. Well, we are here with Dr. Gus Ramage. We are talking about uh, about uh, digestive diseases. There are so many. We do want to talk some about ulcers, and we want to talk some about hepatitis C for the uh, baby boomer generation, something you never would have thought that you would have heard about. But I want to ask you, Gus, as, as medicine is changing here, how, how do you feel that uh, things are progressing? And as we move forward here, you know, I've heard so many young people being told, don't go into medicine, and that used to be such a time-honored profession. That is a hard question to answer because the profession is changing really dramatically uh, over the past, really even just the past five to ten years as more and more physicians are, uh, are becoming employed. Uh, that... Uh, it changes relationships a bit. I don't think that in that at base it changes the physician's commitment to making people better. That is the uh, that's the thing that really makes our profession worthwhile, and and makes it uh, worth getting up uh, every morning to to uh, to go to work and uh, and, uh, and and hope you can help some people. Absolutely. Well, I know one of the things that I know so many doctors are saying is that they're glad they're nearer the end rather than at the beginning of their perfection of their uh, practice. And I wouldn't uh, disagree with that in some ways. Uh, on the other hand, there really is a great deal of, uh, of exciting uh, new technology coming along in a number of areas, which we will talk about a couple of them, uh, as you've mentioned. Uh, but the, the I think the the genetic field, uh, the the things that are coming along there, I think many of the things that are uh, that are being developed uh, uh, in the uh, immunologic fields, or uh, the the specific treatments for disorders that we've had nothing to offer for. Uh, we hear about those it seems every day that there's a, uh, that there's a, a new uh, uh, a new Approach that can be taken, a new drug that's available uh, to to treat things. And so, 
So it's, uh, it, medicine remains very exciting, although uh, doubtless the, uh, some of the relationships and some of the, uh, 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 some of the, the uh, employment situations are going to change drastically. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I always think when I hear about a new drug that's been developed for something and it's advertised on TV, and then they tell you all the side effects on it. It always makes me wonder, should I have the disease, or do I want the cure with the drugs that they're handing out? Well, that's, <laughs> uh, that's a, a very valid question to ask, and, and that's why we need doctors. Absolutely. Because, uh, because we really can't depend on those television advertisements to, uh, to properly inform us. Oh, come on now, Gus. I heard about this <laughs> drug out there, and I want that drug. I bet you get people coming in telling you that. We certainly do. And, uh, and and oftentimes there's a much less expensive uh, alternative that uh, that will work quite well for those folks. Not always. Sure. Uh, but uh, and and these uh, and these uh, these wonder drugs have uh, we, we've been we've been blessed in gastroenterology with uh, with treatments in inflammatory bowel disease that have revolutionized uh, uh, our our treatment approaches. Uh, and yet, we have some old treatments, much less expensive, that work awfully well for folks as well. Absolutely. Well, we are here with Dr. Gus Ramage. We are going to hear a quick word from our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to be talking about ulcers and hepatitis C. Have you heard about hepatitis C? Well, you got to stay tuned right here on WCRS. We'll be right back. Oh, that's right. We're right back here, Sharp Facets Gallery this afternoon. Beautiful afternoon, I might add, out there. And we are talking to Dr. Gus Ramage here this afternoon. He is one of the partners over there at the Digestive Diseases. And I certainly hope that everybody is finding this fascinating, as I am finding, to find out more about the things that uh, we can take care of. One of the things that uh, years and years and years ago was the thing on ulcers. And that's part of digestive diseases. How many people out there have ulcers? Well. Uh, fortunately, fewer and fewer as we have learned to treat them more effectively. Uh, and uh, I think that's one of the really interesting uh, aspects that has developed over the past uh, uh, few years. Uh, uh, say 20 years ago, it was clearly understood that ulcer disease was, was related to acid in the stomach. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that it was excessive acid that caused ulcers and that if one wanted to, if one had ulcers and wanted to be rid of them, uh, we had to find a way to get rid of the acid. Uh, then uh, a, a scientist in Australia noticed that there were bacteria in many of the ulcers and uh, uh, isolated that bacteria and found that though the bacteria was rather difficult to treat, uh, it could be treated, eliminated, and actually the tendency toward ulcers could be cured in many, many people. And, uh, and so uh, we've, had, we've had that whole field has, has developed uh, so that now uh, that's a routine test that we do, uh, every biopsy, uh, that we take from the stomach is tested uh, uh, for for uh, this bacteria, and uh, and we can treat people. The vast majority can be uh, effectively treated, and their tendency toward ulcers uh, effectively cured, if if the bacteria is the reason. Are there any other reasons? One of the other big reasons is the arthritis medication. Arthritis medications. Yes, the uh, the <laughs> Advil and Aleve that you see so uh, so widely promoted. So <laughs> widely promoted, and uh, uh, the the BC powders and and uh, and Goody powders. Oh really? Uh, that uh, and and the, and that wonder drug aspirin that <laughs> that we that we see uh, uh, that we see widely promoted. All of those drugs. Uh, have a very strong tendency to cause ulcer disease. Uh, they, uh, that ulcer disease, interestingly, tends to be painless. 
and uh, may present with bleeding instead of uh, instead of with pain. And so that is actually the becoming the majority of ulcer disease that we're seeing now. So the only way to not have that is not to be taking those? Is to, or to, minima, to minimize their use. Uh, used uh, intermittently and, and in lower dose, uh, these, these drugs, are, uh, they're very effective for arthritis, no question. But, um, but uh, in higher doses and used on a daily basis, and particularly uh, used at older age, uh, they, uh, they have a, a strong tendency to cause ulcers. Wow, okay. Well, there you go. We just learned something else here today. I tell you what, this has been really fascinating for you to come out here. Uh, I know you've been very, very busy, and we had well, to wait a long time, much. but it's been a great thing to have you here this afternoon. Now we want to talk about uh, baby boomers and um, hepatitis C. That came out a few months ago. Only a few months ago, the uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, uh, came out with a recommendation that uh, essentially anyone over 50 should be tested for hepatitis C, and that's because the generation that uh, that is that age uh, has a fairly high incidence of hepatitis C for several reasons. Uh, uh, one of which is that that was a uh, that was the the time of the uh, of the uh, uh, of, of, of intravenous drugs. Uh, and people really didn't understand the risks that they entailed back then. So you're talking about in the 60s there, We're right? talking yes. about the 60s. Yes, that and wild time in life. It was. And, uh, and a lot of folks who are now very responsible uh, citizens uh, were... That wouldn't even ever were, admit. That, <laughs> were, right, time. right. Were, uh, were far less responsible with their own health back then. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing was that there was no ability to test for uh, this organism in that time. That developed in the early 90s, actually. Uh, and so, uh, so not only was it that the people, uh, th that it was being spread in that group, it was being spread by blood transfusions because there was no way to, uh, to test for, uh, for the virus in the blood. Uh, Hepatitis A and B could be tested for, but hepatitis C could not. And so, uh, so uh, things began to get a great deal safer in the 90s uh, when we began to be able to test for hepatitis C in the blood. Also, of course, able to test for uh, HIV in the blood at about the same time. Uh, so, so blood transfusions became a great deal safer. But people who received blood before about 1986 are at very definitely increased risk and should be tested. Uh, anyone who's ever uh, uh, done recreational drugs definitely needs to be tested. And again, the CDC recommends anyone over age 50 at this time. One of the other reasons for recommending testing at this time is that the, the treatments are becoming more effective. Treatment is treatment for this uh, disorder is difficult. Uh, there's a, a lot of symptoms involved, and and uh, and it's it's uh, a pretty tough thing to go through. But it seems like every few years now uh, we are getting more effective treatments uh, and able to cure a, a larger percentage of the folks who who have the disease and to prevent cirrhosis of the liver by doing so. That is what happens with hepatitis C, is that correct? In a substantial percent of people who have it, not everyone, okay. uh, probably about 25% of people who have hepatitis C uh, will develop end stage disease from it. Wow. So, um, and what type, of, what type of cure is there? I mean, what type of, how do they treat it? Uh, the drugs are, are basically, uh, the, the current the current cocktail is, okay. <laughs> is, uh, is uh, there is a, a pill that is taken uh, 
three times. It's taken really every eight hours. It has to be taken extremely regularly every eight hours. Uh, there's another uh, uh, pill called, uh, uh, called ribavirin that has to be taken twice daily. And there's an injection uh, called uh, interferon that has to be given every week. Each of these things has significant side effects. Uh, and uh, People get significantly anemic, uh, uh, they get uh, flu-like reactions and such. So it's not, uh, it's not that easy. On the other hand, uh, it's, uh, uh, we're, we're treating a serious disease and can do so effectively. One of the other good things is that we're seeing improved treatments come out every few years and there, uh, there is on the horizon now uh, even more effective therapy. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Gus Ramage, you have been right here on WCRS right here in Greenwood. We certainly appreciate you coming out here today. Thanks so much. I really thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it very much. All right. Thank you so much. That's going to do it for us. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Bye-bye, everybody.